What's up, everybody? We're back with another fantasy football video for week one. We're going to be talking about week one summary games and my key takeaways for each of these teams for the games that happened on Sunday. Um, I'm going to limit myself to 15 minutes on all to talk about these games, and I will go into my key points about each team that you should keep in mind for your fantasy roster and some key trends that I noticed. So if you're interested in more content like this, please check out my channel. I make a wide variety of content, not just on fantasy football, but on other stuff as well. So we'll get right into it, and we'll talk about the Chargers versus the Washington football team. So my biggest takeaway with the Chargers is that Mike Williams, he had a good game. He's got a lot of involvement in this offense. It seems that the new – and honestly, there were not a lot of targets for Austin Eckler. He didn't catch any passes today. It was all – Pretty much Keenan Allen, Mike Williams. So I'm very interested to see if that trend continues or if that's just a product of the Washington football team defense. Speaking of the Washington football team, they, um, unfortunate injury of Ryan Fitzpatrick, that limits a lot of the upside of the potential that we had for receiver breakouts for Terry McLaurin, guys like that. But what I really like from them is 20 carries for Antonio Gibson, 90 yards. And he also got involved in the pass game as well. Had more targets significantly than J.D. McKissick. Looks like he's a good every down back that you might want to try to buy low on. I'll be talking about him more in the next video that's coming out on Tuesday. Um, so now we go to Pittsburgh and Buffalo. And my biggest takeaway for Pittsburgh is be patient with Najee Harris. Don't sell him right now. I know he had a tough first game, but he's also going up against a tough defense. The Bills are a good defense. He's going to have more opportunities with this team as the game goes along. And I'm very optimistic despite the fact of this game. Wouldn't be worried about him. For Buffalo, my key takeaway with them is that Cole Be Beasley is a must-add in PPR. 13 targets, 8 receptions, 60 yards. If you're in a PPR league, you have to make sure you have Cole Beasley, especially given this offense. And this is going up against Pittsburgh, which, based on the way they played against Buffalo, they might be the best defense in the league. So definitely make sure you add Cole Beasley onto your team. Next, we go to the New York Jets and the Carolina Panthers. So my biggest takeaway with the Jets is that, you know, this is Zach Wilson's first game. We're trying to figure out who his preferred receivers are. And it definitely looked to me that Corey Davis, as expected, is going to be one of his preferred guys. But also, surprisingly, Braxton Berrios was, had a pretty heavy involvement as well as a slot PPR guy. So he's somebody to keep an eye on to uh, maybe consider in there if you're really in a pinch for some PPR value. For Carolina, my takeaway is there were some questions about Christian McCaffrey and how he would look with Chuba Hubbard coming in and, you know, what is his offense gonna, involvement going to be coming off injury-riddled season last year, and he pretty much proved to everybody why he's the number one overall pick in this league. If he stays healthy, he, he almost I, – I don't know if he led running backs by the end of the day in terms of total fantasy points but in PPR leagues, but – he didn't even have a touchdown today, and he had almost 190 all-purpose yards. So, yeah, you want to make sure that, that there's no doubt this guy is the best player in football right now. Here's the running back position. Um, Houston. So my takeaway with Houston, I have two for them. One of them is kind of like a personal one because of my kicker preference, which I'm going to get into in a sec. But Mark Ingram, as their running back, looks like he has got the full handle of this backfield 26 carries, I believe, um, just dominated the backfield. He's got to have some opportunities potentially with them as their lead back in spite of his age. However, he is a significant guy to consider selling high on um, given his age and possibility for injuries. My take, other takeaway with Houston is, you know, I talk about why kickers, you want to buy them uh, in the waivers and you don't want to draft kickers high. And you can check out my video for that below. But case in point, week one, Joey Sly, who was cut by the Panthers and signed by Houston, who was undrafted almost in every league, was the number one kicker this week. So it just goes to show, do not draft high on kickers because you can find guys off on the waivers that will probably be better value for you. Um, and then my takeaway for Jacksonville, very brutal game. Um, I have a lot of hesitancy about this team, but particularly for the running game. Um, Houston was not projected to be a good defense at all. They couldn't get anything going running the ball. And they've got some pretty tough defenses, including the Colts twice. And I'm just very, they got to play the, I believe they're playing, uh, uh, yeah, it's just, 
they've I'm very cautious about this this team's running game. So James Robinson, very concerned with him. Um, next, so we go to the Arizona Tennessee game. So I talk Arizona. My biggest takeaway. Another point that I've made on this channel is that defenses you can get late for excellent value. And Arizona's defense looks for real. They were going up against a pretty well-regarded offense in Arizona, or excuse me, in Tennessee, and were able to get all kinds of pressure on Ryan Tannehill. Derrick Henry wasn't able to get anything going. There are some concerns for Arizona because they've got to play some better offenses within their division as the season goes along. But later on this year, they're going to get... Um, they're, they're going to get Jacksonville and Houston, so that's going to be beneficial to them. And it just goes to show, wait to your, for your defense, because you can get guys teams like Arizona, which can be good value for you off waivers or stream value. Tennessee, my takeaway is, I, would, I wouldn't panic about these guys. In fact, a lot of these guys I try to buy low on. Derrick Henry um, struggled in this game, but I think he's going to have more value as the season goes along. Try to get him now while he's had a, a game like this where he didn't necessarily have any breakout runs. Um, also, guys like uh, Ryan Tannehill, I would consider buying low on as well. Julio Jones, guys like that, because I think Tennessee is going to have better games as the season goes along. Not too worried about them so far. A team that I am worried about, though, is the Atlanta Falcons. Um, I was, I thought they'd go off to in this game because they're going against the Eagles, which is not a very highly regarded defense, but they really struggled. Um, not only in terms of the passing game, Matt Ryan only had 164 yards, but rushing the ball, Mike Davis was not very effective. Cordero Patterson was actually the most efficient running back they had, and he was a wide receiver a couple years ago. Um, also, Kyle Pitts is splitting receptions with Hayden Hurst, so that's concerning to his value. So Atlanta got a lot of questions with them. We'll see how they do as the week goes on, but got a lot of concerns with their key players. Eagles, though, um, my takeaway is that Hertz is an example of why you wait for a quarterback till the end. Because Hertz value, um, 264 yards, three touchdowns. He also had 62 yards rushing the ball. So he's he's a, an excellent example of why you wait for some of these guys at the end of the draft. It'll still give you great stats because Hertz put up value that was better than uh, Matt Ryan, who is Matt Ryan's generally taken higher than Hertz, Josh Allen, Aaron Rodgers. For this week, I'll get into Aaron Rodgers in a sec, but Jalen Hurts, example of why you want to wait for your quarterbacks in fantasy football. Um, Minnesota, Cincinnati. So my takeaway with the Vikings is that a lot of they were all down a lot of this game, and I wasn't really expecting them to be down, but their offense used a lot of three receiver sets, and they generally in the past have been mostly two receiver dependent between Justin Jefferson and and Adam Thielen, but K.J. Osborne got a lot more involvement in this game. Um, I think that was more of a product of the fact that they were down, but I'm interested to see how that progresses going forward because Thielen had a good game, Justin Jefferson a little bit disappointing, but if they're going to adapt more of a three-receiver format, it kind of changes our outlook on how we view these uh, wide receivers for Minnesota. And then Cincinnati, my takeaway is that Joe Mixon – and Jamar Chase looked like the guys that are going to be the focal point of this team. Joe Mixon really controlled the game against what I thought would have been a pretty solid defense, but Joe Mixon actually did extremely well. He's the only back or running back that really has the majority of the touches in Cincinnati. Small J. P. Red's not really a threat to him. And then Jamar Chase leading the team in targets, also getting a nice touchdown as well. Very impressed with him too. San Francisco and Detroit. So my takeaway with San Francisco is that their running back backfield is just an absolute mess. Um, Raheem Mostert gets injured, but apparently it was a precautionary injury. And then Trey Sermon was the one that everybody thought was going to be the guy to step up next. But it's Elijah Mitchell, who nobody had on the radar, who is out there. And he's going to be one of the guys out on waivers. Um, but I'm a little concerned about how his value is actually going to translate throughout the whole season. Because this backfield has just been a committee continually under Kyle Shanahan. Jamichael Hasty also got a touchdown as well. So is Trey Sermon going to get more involvement if Mostert is out for quite a while? That's a question too, but I'm really not even sure if Sermon will even break out because he didn't. If he was a healthy scratch, why did they not play him today if they were super confident in his abilities to step up 
in the system. So there's just a lot of questions I have with them. Detroit, though, their backfield to me, it looks like you could pretty much start either of these guys, Swift or Williams. And a lot of that is because their wide receiver core is so poor that Jerry Goff seems to have a preference for these two running backs. Um, so and I, I talked about in my last video, you want to buy low on Jamal Williams because he, going into week one, because he has shown that he could be effective as a secondary change of pace back in the past with the Packers. The Lions don't have as many weapons, and he proved that. So if you went out and bought low, you got a lot of great value out of him this week. Seattle. So Seattle's takeaway for me is that with Rashad Penny's calf injury, we see more value for Chris Carson. He didn't necessarily have a great game against the Colts here, but he did have three catches as well, which is a good sign for him because he's not always the most involved in terms of pass catching. But given that there's the Rashad Penny injury and Generally, a lack of other running backs getting involved as well. Um, I think Chris Carson will have more value going forward, going up against a tough run defense against the Colts, but he's going to have more opportunity as we progress forward. For the Colts, um, Carson Wentz, again, we're seeing what his preferences are on this team, and it looks like he's definitely preferences the running backs. Jonathan Taylor, six receptions, 60 yards. Naheem Hines, six receptions, 48 yards, and those were the two team leaders and targets. So... We'll see how this progresses going forward, but we thought that Seattle's pass defense was not going to be um, very intimidating, and he's still preferencing the running back. So it's very concerning for guys like Michael Pittman, but T.Y. Hilton when he gets healthy, but definitely good for guys like Naheem Hines and Jonathan Taylor. Um, Miami and New England. So my takeaway with Miami is that Gaskin did not really stand out as somebody who is getting a huge load of the backfield. They split it up. Nine carries Gaskin, five carries Malcolm Brown. They were throwing a lot this game. Gaskin is going to have value in PPR, but if you're in a standard league, I would be very cautious about how you handle him moving forward this season. Um, for New England, so might be a good opportunity to buy low on some of these guys for New England because next week they're going up against the Jets, which should be a, by far an easier matchup for them than against the Miami Dolphins. Um, some guys include Nelson Aguilar, Jacoby Myers, maybe even the two tight ends as well um, in Johnny Smith and Hunter Henry as well. My takeaway with Cleveland, so for Cleveland, Chubb and Hunt are both guys that you could start in the backfield and be confident in even if they're taking away touches from each other because this team is very dependent on the run to be successful. And in terms of their pass catchers, they're throwing it to the running backs quite a bit. There's not really, I know they didn't have Odell Beckham Jr. in this game, but other than Jarvis Landry, there were not really any receivers that stood out. And I think that's by design. This is a run-heavy offense. Kansas City. So my takeaway is try to buy low on Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. He didn't have a great game today, but he's going to have opportunity moving forward with this team because they're just so explosive. Cleveland has a good uh, run defense as well. So Clyde Edwards-Hilaire will get his opportunities, especially when the Chiefs will be playing with a lead as the season goes on. My takeaway with Green Bay, this is a team you do not want to panic on. They are going to get better as the season goes along. I think Aaron Rodgers is dusting off the rust from his past games. Um, but he'll be fine. I'm not super worried about the Packers. Guys like Aaron Jones, Devontae Adams, I'll be talking about them later on in Tuesday's video. For New Orleans, this is one of the top defense potential. And I talked about this with Arizona's defense, but a team you could widely get at the end of drafts or on waivers. And you look at their upcoming schedule, um, they have a lot of favorable games. Um, just a quick rundown of who they have to face. They're playing Carolina next, which did not necessarily stand out. New England, which has Mac Jones. They fumbled a couple times against the Dolphins. They got the Giants, who have the, the king of fumbles, Daniel Jones. And then the Washington football team, which just lost their quarterback. So they've got a lot of great opponents coming up over the next few weeks. Try to get the Saints defense if they're still on waivers. My takeaway for the New York Giants-Denver game. So for Giants, I really am concerned about Saquon Barkley going up against Denver. I know they're solid defense, but if, if that line does not do a better job pro protecting it, if Daniel Jones doesn't prove that he can take over games. They're just going to continually zone in on Saquon Barkley. They've got Washington next. Very concerned about his value moving forward. Denver, um, Jerry Judy's injury is very rough for them because he was standing out as a receiver, but it could open opportunities for Noah Fant, who actually did lead the team in targets 
So keep an eye on Fant. If you do have him, I think he could be some solid value to move forward with in fantasy. And then my last takeaway, slightly over 15 minutes. Um, I give myself credit because I had an intro, but Chicago Bears in Los Angeles. So my takeaway for Chicago is I, I think that they couldn't get anything downfield, but I think a lot of that is because the Rams' pass defense is very good. Um, Allen Robinson, I would definitely consider buying low on. And I think things are going to get better for them when Justin Fields starts, which is inevitable, basically. And then the Los Angeles Rams. I talked about how Cooper Cup was the guy that I thought was going to end up being the lead receiver on this team. And that turned out to be correct. Looks like Matthew Stafford really has a preference for him on this team to be the focal point. And then for Sony Michelle, he, he just doesn't have any value to me. Because he only had one carry in this game, and he already doesn't provide you anything in the passing game, so might as well drop him if you have him. All right, well, that's all I've got for this video. Um, stay tuned for buy low, sell high video that I will make on Tuesday for players that I would recommend you try to pick up and, and drop, etc. for the upcoming week two. And let me know what you think. I'll see you guys next time.